My first impression jumping into the Red Sea was just crystal clear water, very colorful, very thriving, extreme biodiversity. So it's really a pleasure and a privilege to experience these reefs. Hi, my name is Alex Catan. Uh, I'm a master's student in marine science at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. And I'm here in southern Sudan uh, to study the fish on the reefs. Here in the Red Sea, Sudan represents probably the best state coral reefs for the region. These reefs really can present uh, themselves as a baseline of pristine conditions on Red Sea reefs. So learning how fish populations exist on Sudanese reefs is very interesting and then we compare those to what we see in other regions. In Saudi Arabia, fishing pressure has been quite high and sustained for decades, whereas here in Sudan, fishing intensity is, is very weak. So here I have my dive slate. It's some underwater paper, firmly secured with some rubber bands. It has a list of all the species that I may encounter during my fish counts. So as I see these fish, I'll make notes as to how many there are and how big they are. One of my most important tools is my underwater tape measure. Uh, I will use this to help me uh, lay down my transect and know exactly how far I swim when I'm counting the fish. This is very important so we get a very good idea of how many fish there are in a given area. While I'm laying out the tape, I count all large-bodied fish greater than 50 centimeters, but these tend to be the kind of fish that, that are highly mobile, the ones that scare more easily, so I focus on those first. On the way back on the tape, I count all the smaller species, so things generally smaller than 50 centimeters, less mobile, scare less easily, smaller-bodied fishes. A strong current can make my life quite, quite, quite frustrating as I'm trying to multitask, uh, counting and, and laying out the tape and taking video and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, in the Red Sea, we have pretty forgiving conditions. And so in general, I tend to have very nice and smooth dives. Experiencing a swim with a manta is just a very powerful experience. They're very large and impressive and, and graceful creatures. They're so free and agile. They can't do anything but inspire you. This particular manta was very inquisitive and very friendly. It was a privilege to be able to swim with that creature for so long. So I have an Excel spreadsheet where I write down key information such as the name of the reef, the date, the time of the day, which can be quite important. And then I'll go ahead and start adding the specific species from my list. What I hope is to then be able to produce a sort of biomass pyramid, so a graph. What it shows is the different proportions of different groups of fish. Cousteau Society 
has a Red Sea Shark and Ray monitoring program. The purpose of this program is to gain any information possible as to the status uh, and population of sharks and rays in the Red Sea. Here on Don Cuesto, the captain and crew play their part in citizen science and conservation, which is of crucial importance. Hi guys, I'm Maurizio Carenza. I'm the dive guide of Don Cuesto, 2012. We start to make this work, this survey. So each dive, we focused to recognize almost the kind of shark that we see, the amount of them, and of course, if we can manage also the sex. We want to know where they are. We want to get an idea of how many there are. We also want to know what areas um, they're at. And also another thing most important that drive the condition that we have outside. Wind, no wind, current. So how this influence the, the behavior of the shark. Eventually, maybe Sudan is going to look at protecting certain areas, we will know maybe this site is a nursery and this site is important for feeding and this site is another nursery. This year increased the number of the hammerhead, especially in the deep south area. They grow very slowly, they take a long time to reach maturity and they don't produce a lot of young. And other things most important, a lot of babies. So when you start to see a school hammerhead and half of this school are all babies, sites between one meter, this is a very, very good thing. For me and for many scientists, the Red Sea is a truly unique body of water, historically as well as environmentally. Southern Sudan in particular has a certain adventurous allure. It's a place where not very many divers get to experience. It's quite remote and its near pristine uh, state is just completely compelling. Even after one week of diving on southern Sudanese reefs, the presence of large snappers and, and groupers is very obvious. Key features of a healthy intact ecosystem, and I hope that these populations can be maintained for years to come. The purpose of the shark cam is to try and get footage of sharks in between dives, so when divers are not around. It generally runs for about an hour and a half. On the subsequent dive, Maurizio, the dive guide, can go down and, and retrieve that camera. So afterwards we can see if any uh, sharks or other interesting critters show up. Gray reef shark. And that's very interesting because then we can you know, make note of that, estimate its size, and so forth. One of the important things we can learn about fish is how old they are. So in order to age a fish, what we can do is we can extract a pair of bones called otoliths uh, that are located in the brain cavity. So here is an otolith. This is what it looks like. Just like uh, the rings on, of trees, uh, bony fish as they grow, the otoliths also grow. Every ring being one year. When we take these to the lab and we can polish them up and we can count the rings. I'm also taking note of the length of these fish. When you start pairing age and length, you can make a nice curve that shows how long fish get as they age. Very important for resource managers who want to put fishing restrictions or regulations in place to keep reproductive adults in the gene pool. On a typical coral reef dive in the Red Sea, it's quite rare to encounter a shark such as the whale shark. When I see a whale shark, the first thing I think about is trying to get some pictures of it. They can eat really a lot of different things. Fish eggs, larvae, you know, uh, sperm, 
they can eat all that. As well as from coral, they can eat the coral spawning. They can eat krill and shrimp, so like little crustaceans. And also small fish like anchovy. Whale sharks are always on the hunt for food. They're a big animal and they need to eat a lot. They do have teeth, the 300 to 350 rows of teeth. So they're in their mouth, they don't use them, but they're very small. What they do use is filter pads near their gills. And that's where most of the food particles is trapped and then it can be swallowed. Whale sharks can be identified by the signature that their dots create on their body. So if you get photos of, of the left and the right side, as, as well as um, identifying the gender of the individual, this can be important stuff that you can then share with scientists. From two weeks of diving in, in southern Sudan, it's quite obvious that the low levels uh, of fishing pressure really result in, in a more robust and intact ecosystem. On these reefs, we see much healthier populations of, of snappers and groupers, jacks, which are encountered regularly on every single dive. I really hope that my study can help persuade resource managers in Saudi Arabia to really boost their conservation efforts. But what's also really lacking in, in Saudi Arabia is uh, an environmental awareness. So it's very important that we reach out to the youth and uh, the public as much as possible to inspire them and really empower them, showing them how fantastic the resources are beneath the waves, to be proud of what they have and manage it more appropriately for future generations. Yeah.